Unicorn Art from Medieval Symbolism to Contemporary Kitsch with Paula Rose. Now, first of all, it is a known fact that young girls love unicorn collectibles, including Lisa Frank Trapper Keepers. And the reason for this, of course, is that unicorns symbolize several things in modern culture, including uniqueness, imagination, magic, and purity. And all of those symbolic associations actually date back a lot further in art history than you might think. First of all, skeptics might tell you that unicorns are not real. In fact, there is no scientific evidence that unicorns have ever actually roamed the earth. However, there are several real animals that may have served as the inspiration for unicorns in the Western imagination. For one thing, accounts of Indian one-horned rhinoceri may have sparked the original unicorn curiosity. If, and if you think about it, if you've never seen a rhinoceros and you hear a description of it, it might kind of sound like a horse with a single horn. Also, narwhals, of course, those wonderful sea creatures with giant tusks, giant pointed tusks protruding from their foreheads. When their tusks washed up on the shore and were found, uh, they may have served in the medieval mind as proof that indeed unicorns did exist. And in fact, if you got a rhinoceros horn or a narwhal tusk and you hollowed it out, uh, it would be accepted as a real unicorn horn drinking vessel because of course unicorn horns have purification qualities, which we're going to talk about, and, and could serve as an antidote for poison, in theory. Fun fact, the words unicorn and rhinoceros were actually used interchangeably throughout the Middle Ages, although obviously unicorns evolve into a very different creature, mythological or not. Another possible inspiration for unicorns is the art of the ancient Near East. For example, this wonderful relief at Persepolis in present-day Iran uh, from sometime around 500 BCE depicts a horned animal, and although we believe that it is intended to be seen as two horns in profile. Ancient Greek visitors may have misinterpreted this pictorial convention and may have gone home talking about mythical one-horned creatures uh, in Iran. We know, for example, that a Greek doctor named Theseus actually spent eight years working for the king of Persia, and when he went home to Greece, he was responsible for their earliest known description of a unicorn in the West, in Western Europe. In the 4th century BCE, Theseus, this Greek physician, his name is C-T-E-S-I-A-S, -S, he wrote that people in India were using powdered unicorn horn for cramps, epilepsy, and poisoning. However, it turns out that Theseus never actually traveled to India, so we're not entirely sure where he got this information, but apparently it was hearsay. However, this leads to a belief in the medicinal properties of unicorn horn, which persisted well into the late ninth, or I'm sorry, the late seventeenth century. In fact. A guy named Pierre Pomé was, in the 17th century, a French physician, and he was pharmacist to Louis XIV. And in 1694, he wrote a book called The General History of Drugs. And in it, he wrote that unicorn horn could be used to cure poison. 
Now, in a later chapter, he does admit that most unicorn horns are really narwhal tusks, but, but that's beside the point because the medicinal properties of unicorn horn are still being touted well into the 17th century. Now, another possible source for the unicorn legend might be ancient China. In fact, it might have made its way to India from ancient China. There is an ancient Chinese mythological creature called a Qi Lin, and this dates as far back as 2700 BCE. And its horn was marketed as an aphrodisiac well into the 20th century. And it was described as having the body of a deer, hooves of a horse, tail of an ox, head of a wolf, and of course, large horn. The Chi Lin was considered the king of animals and could live to be a thousand years old. And this is my favorite part. The Chi Lin, according to legend, could emit beams of the five sacred colors that have symbolic importance in Buddhism. Okay, so a, a unicorn-like mythological creature emitting beams of five colors. That's right. The motif of the unicorn spewing a rainbow from its hindquarters did not originate with Lisa Frank. It actually may be almost 5,000 years old. And so that means that your Lisa Frank Trapper Keeper that you had in fourth grade might have had a pedigree that you were not aware of at the time. Now, of course, unicorn horns also, they, they do have purification properties. They were more valuable than gold in the Middle Ages. And eventually they came to have Christological symbolism, meaning they were seen as resembling a crucifix because of course it was the Middle Ages and everything needed to be symbolic for Jesus in the Middle Ages. And the unicorn horn pictured here is located at the Cloisters branch of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. They do, in fact, own a real-life unicorn horn as part of their collection. Of course, it probably is actually a narwhal tusk, but it historically was believed to be a real unicorn horn. Also at the Cloisters Museum is a wonderful series of tapestries called the Unicorn Tapestries. And first of all, these are exquisitely crafted. They are each about 12 foot square. And a tapestry means that the image is woven of different colored threads. Okay, so the imagery in a tapestry is not applied after the fact, after the fabric is woven, but is actually part of the integrity of the actual fabric itself. And yet these large woven wall hangings are incredibly detailed. In fact, they contain over a hundred species of plants, each of which are individually distinguishable and identifiable and have symbolic value as well. In fact, this particular tapestry series melds the secular and religious symbolism of the unicorn in a gift that this series of tapestries was intended as a gift for the wedding of Anne of Brittany, who was only 12 years old at the time and she was betrothed to Louis XII of France, for land, of course. It's a pretty nice wedding present for a 12-year-old. It actually is a lot nicer than Elisa Frank Trapper Keeper. Uh, but basically within this tapestry, the 
plant species correspond with unicorn symbolism. So for example, the unicorn is using his horn, he's dipping it into the water in order, of course, to purify the water. And this is a very magnanimous act. He's doing this so that all of the creatures can, can drink from the water and be healthy and happy. And around the unicorn are different plant species that at the time were used for purification, including sage and orange. Also near the unicorn's head is a rose bush which has thorns and so it's associated with martyrdom. So again, the unicorn is an allegory for Christ in this particular case and in many, many, many cases throughout medieval art. And in fact, he's being, he's being pursued or hunted by 12 hunters which correspond of course with 12 apostles or 12 disciples. And also, some of the other plants and animals you can make out in this tapestry include strawberries and rabbits, which are associated with romantic love and fertility. And so that makes this a perfect wedding present, even as it contains biblical allegory as well. Now in this particular panel, unfortunately this panel is badly damaged. In fact, this is only a fragment of the original panel, uh, but it was looted during the French Revolution and uh, we believe that any parts of it that represented the aristocracy were destroyed. Um, also, it was possibly used to store and transport potatoes. And here, this is the scene where the unicorn is captured. Now, according to legend, a unicorn could only be captured by a virgin. And of course, you know this if you've ever seen the movie Legend with Tom Cruise, where they say a unicorn can only be approached by someone who is pure of heart. But of course, that's code for a virgin. So this virginal maiden is, is luring the unicorn into an enclosed garden, which, which also represents purity. And then the hunters will be able to then capture and slaughter the unicorn. And that brings me to the panel where the unicorn is killed and brought to the castle. Of course, here the unicorn is wearing a crown of thorny oak branches. And so you get the idea. The unicorn is a martyr. He's a symbol of Christ. He is associated with purification, purification of humanity, forgiveness of sins. He will resurrect in the next tapestry panel and all will be well. In the Renaissance, unicorns were considered an appropriate subject for women painters like Barbara Lunghi. This is her lovely lady with a unicorn from 1595. And in fact, Barbara Lunghi is a painter who is mostly known for her depictions of the Virgin Mary. Now, because unicorn horns are associated with purity and Christ, uh, they eventually became associated with the Virgin Mary because, again, a unicorn representing Christ can only be captured by a virgin. And this is an allegory for the Virgin Mary as a vessel for Christ who comes to the earth and, and purifies humanity. But eventually unicorns are also associated with other virginal saints and even other noble women in general. However, the Council of Trent, which basically created lots of reforms within the Catholic Church, they met between 1545 and 1563. And one of their tasks was to reform the arts. Now, they did also, of course, ban the sale of indulgences and other corrupt practices within the church. But when it comes to art, they realized that 
religious art had become confusing and decadent and difficult to decipher. And so they wanted to create some guidelines for religious art because it was intended to be educational for the masses, most of whom were illiterate at the time. So the Council of Trent proscribed any depictions of biblical themes shown in an unusual or confusing manner. And so after 1563, there were a lot fewer depictions of unicorns in a religious context. However, in the 17th century, unicorns will sh still show up in secular settings, such as coats of arms and, yes, medical and scientific texts. So for example, here is an engraved illustration from Pierre Pomé's General History of Drugs, which I mentioned earlier. This was printed in Paris in 1694. And again, within this text, Pomé mentions that a powdered unicorn horn can be used for an antidote to poison. Today, modern and contemporary artists also utilize unicorn imagery in their works. For example, in 2006, St. Clair Semin made a wonderful sculpture called Lycorn. This was commissioned by the curator of a museum in Paris who wanted a mount for a unicorn horn, a historic unicorn horn in their collection. Of course, now understood to be a, a narwhal tusk. And so the two decided to create an homage to the 16th century Benevenuto Cellini, who had described making a perfect sculpture of a unicorn head for, as a mount for a, a real, at the time, unicorn horn. So an homage to that, St. Clair Semin, makes a, an exquisite bronze, unicorn bust in order to mount this huge narwhal tusk and so it's a it's a contemporary work that references the past likewise the the paintings of Shanique Smith which also incorporate collage and are absolutely lovely this is Tiny Dancer from 2013, and, and her works also reference the history of unicorns. And in fact, she said in an interview, quote, I suppose as an adult, I lost the hope of seeing one because some say they only appear to virgins. Now I feel like they evoke a sparkle of graceful mystery and remind me of my own youthful wishes. I think that sums up beautifully why unicorns are still a big part of the modern imagination. In 2008, Kimberly Hart created a unicorn trap, which she called Unicorn Bait. And she constructed this of wood and tin materials and also an acrylic mirror, which is shaped like a presumably virginal maiden. And since the outline of the maiden is reflective, the viewer will see him or herself in the outline of the maiden, and, and therefore the identity of the viewer is unclear. Is the viewer the pursued unicorn, the hunter, the, the bait, the virgin? It's really not clear. And that's what makes it interesting, of course. And in 2014, an artist named Justin Maribel used unicorns as part of an epic allegory of environmentalism. This was a series called The Legend of the Waste Not Mystics, which was shown at the Wonder Fair Gallery in Lawrence, Kansas. And in this narrative constructed by Maribel, there is a geneticist named Percival Turvius, and he created 
a magical horn horse using the modern science of genetics, uh, but unfortunately then he passed away. So his creatures were captured and exploited by an evil oil baron. But then they escaped, they organized, and they created an uprising against consumer culture, and they roam the countryside now fighting to protect nature. And they call themselves the Waste Not Mystics. And so obviously unicorns exist in the realm of the mystical. Uh, they are both sacred and profane, and they are more than the sum of their parts. Unicorns are not simply mutant horses. They are not just narwhals or rhinoceri. They represent everything that is unique and pure and romantic and ideal in the modern imagination.